Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you Ananya Bhattacharji, who came from India and who is the co-founder of our partner organization, Society for Labor and Development. Her CV is like six pages long. I asked for a short uh, description. <laughs> um, but with these interviews today, we also wanted to get a more personal insight into what makes uh, the activists and the experts we invited today, what made them choose to go their way, basically. So I would ask you to give us a brief overview on what SLD, Society for Labor and Development, is doing. And then I will try to get a more personal insight of yours. Is that okay? Um, so, can you all hear me? Okay. Well, Society for Labor and Development is, uh, is a fairly new, uh, young organization. It was started in, founded in 2006 and really kind of got going in 2008 or seven or uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, it started in a local area where there's a lot of industrial workers producing things for the global market and 100% ununionized. So it began with, as a labor rights organization for that area, and now it has become labor rights and migrant rights because most of the workers are migrants coming from rural areas. And it is becoming more of a national organization by linking rural to urban and trying to see why, why this is, we know why this is happening, but how should we go about organizing around it? So that's kind of what it is. And maybe you can just also briefly tell about the project we have together with Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung uh, about the yeah. resource so, center. Uh, so uh, SLD and RLS uh, has this partnership uh, that is going on, which is exactly about the work that I just said, which is an inter building of an interstate migration. Uh, uh, it, it, the project is interstate migration. That's really what it is. And the process is that we are building migrant rights centers in both uh, source states from, the, from where migrants are coming and migrant rights centers in destination area where the migrants are arriving, and to uh, really build local structures around what we call the MRCs, to understand local conditions, to serve migrants better, and to understand what a rural and urban agenda, not agenda, but rural urban uh, uh, coalition or a collaboration would look like because we think that urban in development and rural development are not isolated they are linked and how do we link them how do we build a different idea of development and what made you become a co-founder of SLD? What was the reason that you decided with other people to start this? I think that SLD is too young for me to uh, start there and I'm quite old. So uh, I'll just give a short thing about why I do what I do. Um, yes. And uh, it'll be very simple. Um, I was uh, born in eastern India, um, which is where most of the migrants come from. So I was born in Bihar, Jharkhand area, and I'm from the eastern state of West Bengal. And uh, I grew up in a, uh, uh, I won't say poor, but uh, above poverty, but not very well off family. Uh, where my father was the first uh, uh, first child to go to college. And uh, after he finished his bachelor's, which was a big achievement for the family, it immediately fell upon him to support everybody else. So, uh, so our house was always like a railway station and uh, 
my father's salary always disappeared very fast. And, uh, and so, uh, but one thing that, and my mother actually did not go to school. He, she studied a bit, she was literate, she could read, but she didn't, she wanted to study very much and she never got a chance to study. She was married off to my father. And uh, I think she was, she always valued education for that purpose because she felt she missed it. So no matter what, she decided all her children would be educated, boy or girl, except the boy was more uh, cared for than the girl, but we all got educated. Uh, she got, the, my parents were in debt, but they made sure we went to school. So, and, uh, and also, I think, uh, I would say my family was also a violent family because, which is what happens when you have scarcity of resources. You have too little money, too many problems, too many people. So it was also, it, it had a lot of different types of violence. So um, I think that I just grew up kind of uh, in a place where I was uh, kind of rebellious, angry, and like, you know, I would find some other kids and I would be like, their lives seem happier than mine and this is miserable, whatever. Of course, everybody has their miseries, but you know, as a child, one thinks that, oh, you know, this is too miserable. <laughs> so anyway, uh, down the line, uh, my brother, who is now a physicist, he uh, was a smart guy. Uh, my parents paid a lot of attention to his education. And he um, got a scholarship to go to the United States to study physics. And uh, I would write him angry letters. Look what's going on. This is horrible and whatnot. And uh, so then he, he, uh, he was like, okay, I really can't solve the problem. I think I have to bring you and join me here in the United States. And he wasn't earning any money. He was going to college. So he borrowed money from somebody else uh, whom he married later. Uh, and he uh, paid for my ticket to come to the United States. I got scholarship to go to college there, thankfully. Uh, because as I said, my parents were like, study, 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 all that. So I, I got scholarship and, uh, and, and like everybody else uh, in these situations, you like, okay, what should I study to, so that I have a salary? I just don't want to be so poor anymore. So then everybody was like, you should study computers. That's what the going thing. So, so I uh, started uh, computer science and I actually have a master's in computer science. And, uh, and I kind of did it with one eye closed because the other eye was always in college, in campus activism. That was the time of Ronald Reagan. That's how old I am. That was the time of Ronald Reagan in the United States and the invasion of United States of El Salvador and all that, Central America. So I got very involved in uh, imperialism uh, of the United States, in, in refugees coming from Central America. And uh, I was very also inspired by the United States Native American movement, the indigenous people movement. At that time, this uh, well-known revolutionary called Leonard Peltier was in prison and his wife was going around on campuses telling us all about him. And uh, I was just so inspired by Leonard Peltier. And then um, all this imperialism. So as a third world person in the United States, imperialism is sort of the first thing that comes to your mind to work on, you know? So <laughs> it's just like, okay, imperialism. <laughs> And then uh, what I saw actually was that the imperialist struggle in the United States was really white. And the actual people coming from El Salvador, coming from Honduras, coming from these countries were not in the imperialism movement. So I was like, wait a minute, where are all these people who are supposedly streaming into the United States? Why aren't they 
fighting the imperialism struggle with the white people in the United States. Then I realized the, the anti-imperialist struggle in the United States is very white. And the struggles of migrants and refugees is a very different world. And, and uh, the anti-imperialist struggles were not open to what concerns migrants and refugees. So it became a very sort of two, two types of struggles. And then that brought home to me that really one should begin where one is. You know, instead of joining something that is somewhere else, which can always happen, but at the beginning, I should start where I am. And, and then, uh, so what was happening at that time was that the United States immigration law changed. And along with it, much more immigration began to happen of working class people from South Asia, that is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So all of a sudden, domestic workers were South Asians, taxi drivers were all South Asians, restaurant workers were South Asians. So I uh, ended up starting a few organizations because at that time the immigrant communities in South Asia, South Asian immigrants were not organized at all. So I started one organization, the first organization I started was actually a viol uh, organization that fought domestic violence because having faced violence as a child, that was what, uh, you know, aside from imperialism and all of that, that's what kind of my heart really went to. So the f first work that really got me started was actually violence against women. However, it was really funny because as this organization was running along, we, got, we started getting calls from domestic workers who thought domestic violence would, uh, would uh, apply to domestic workers. So, so I was like, oh sure, come along, let's organize domestic workers as well. And then before you know it, we have an organization where, where we have middle class, two upper middle class South Asian immigrant women facing domestic violence and very low wage domestic workers. And soon we had a women's organization which had a class struggle within it. Okay, so uh, I decided to go with the domestic workers. So, uh, so the domestic violence organization exists to this day. Uh, we formed a domestic workers organization. And the domestic workers organization is now part of a National Domestic Workers Alliance in the United States, NDWA, which works with migrant domestic workers across the country. And uh, anyway, so w that made, in, made me go into labor issues because even when doing domestic violence, I was like, a woman really cannot be independent. We are telling women, oh, you know, women are like, I want to leave the house, it's so violent, blah, blah, blah. But they end up not because there is no independence that they really truly had. So economic rights and economic independence is very important. And I went into labor rights. Now at that time, in the 90s in the United States, the labor uh, organization, the Labor Federation in the United States, the National Federation called AFL-CIO, which, which is still conservative today, was even more conservative and racist at that time. In fact, they did not believe in organizing immigrants. In 2000, because they lost their membership and because they realized that immigrants were basically taking over the work, not taking over the work, were a large part of the workforce in the United States, they have to organize immigrants. So then they uh, passed a resolution saying, you know, we should organize immigrants and so on. In the meantime, there were a bunch of people like us who we were just outside the official trade unions and we started what was called worker centers. So they would just be worker organizations 
and we would start them as migrant workers and so on. So, the, so we started domestic workers, migrant workers, there were a lot, I mean, restaurant workers, there was a taxi driver's union, there's like different things that were going on. At the same time, fi fighting police brutality, because like if you're a taxi driver, your first boss is the police. The police beats you up before anybody else. So there are a lot of issues of immigration, law and order, and workplace that come together in the United States. Then I realized I had enough of the United States because the economic uh, in analysis or political analysis reached a ceiling for me. It was like people just wouldn't, they, it's like a glass ceiling. They, they just don't go above it. Uh, so I decided that I would come back to India, which is what I did. Uh, and then when I was in India, we, I started uh, organizing garment workers. Uh, and these now, and, and I joined uh, a national platform of trade unions, which is an independent platform because I won't get into the trade union movement in India, it'll take too long. But this platform was very necessary and I joined it and I started unionizing. And now I'm unionizing in four sectors, garment, auto parts, domestic work, and uh, leather workers, shoe workers. Uh, and what made me start Society for Labor and Development, to answer your question, and I'll stop after this, I promise, is that we, uh, trade unions in India are are not do are not engaging in new practices that are necessary for for building new workers organizations the old model of employment is gone but the leaders have not changed their strategies so uh, so i so we i and another friend we started society for labor and development to do activities in support of labor not unionize that we are doing separately, but there's a whole bunch of research, coalition building, campaigning, uh, and, and support structure, uh, education that is so badly needed for creating cadres, for, cre uh, for, for energizing workers that nobody is really doing. So, so we started this for that purpose. Um, now it has a life of its own, but one thing that is there is that it's anchored in labor. And not too, f too many organizations are that way in India. Um, okay, so I'll just stop there. Yeah, yeah community, ce <laughs> uh, community centers, cultural activities, I mean, the list is long. Yeah. When, uh, when we had a quick briefing, I told Ananya I will ask her for some personal stories. So um, uh, this was all part of the plan, as I also said in the introduction, to get to know what made people the way they are now. I, and I, I would like to say just one sentence, you know, like one can do many things, but one thing I thought is that if I'm going to spend like nine or ten hours of my day doing some job and then volunteer for social justice on the side, what does that say about my life? You know, I have one life. What, what kind of way is that to lead one's life? We have, I have to do, I have to spend maximum amount of hours doing what I love to do, which at that point appeared to be social justice and continues to be. So I think that's very, very important question to ask oneself is, what is the maximum, what is the work I would like to do for maximum number of hours in a day? And my, my family was very upset with me because they thought I would be co go into computers and earn some good money. And, uh, <clears throat> but you know, it, it's true, one should always ask, how does one support oneself through activism? But I think if the intention is there, if the will is there, the way will open. And 
it has done so year after year. I literally live year after year. Like, I don't know this year where my money will come from next year. But to this day, I am independent. I'm dependent on nobody. And I, I do live my life, as you can see, very happily. So I think that is very important when you have a will and a desire, the, the ways open up for you. Amen. Uh, I think this was also very interesting uh, forms of solidarity, which is kind of like the topic for today, like uh, different forms of solidarity. I really like the expression, the, the private train station at home. Um, still, I would be interested in, as you said, uh, in the beginning, you started organizations. How, how did you pay the rent? How did you pay the bills? I mean, did you, did you make a living? Because this is what many people concerns. Yeah. How do I pay my bills after all, like after graduation from university? Yeah. I mean, when I first started an organization, I started it with my uh, apartment telephone. And I had, uh, I did a computer job for two years. So just, I left that out because two years is so short. Two years I did a computer job. I saved some money and I was in parallel doing domestic violence work from my apartment phone and my computer boss was like what is who is this woman she's like all the on the phone all the time even in my office i would be taking calls <laughs> but i got the work got my job done so he couldn't do much about it but he didn't like it at the end i had to leave because how long can you do that um and then i formed an ngo ngo obviously is a entity where you can fundraise. So, you know, I fundraised, you know, I mean, there is no comparison between what I earned those two years and what I earned after that. So, but that's, you know, it's money, um, happiness is definitely not about money. One should, I mean, poverty is not good. I'm not here to promote or, or what should I say, romanticize poverty. All I'm trying to say is that, you know, there are ways to have a good life and be happy, yeah. Yeah, I can remember like hour long discussions uh, in Delhi when we talked about uh, possible potential corporations. Uh, very interesting, very intense, but of course that's also part of the, of the game that you need to you need to deal with each other you need to you propose us things we say this is not working i know this can be tricky too but after all this is in the field that you really like <laughs> yeah um we have like a little list uh, what what questions on what direction uh, could you give us uh, a brief outside in the future what's your what are your hopes what's your next plans what would you like to to see achieved in the near future I think what is very, very important is that people's hearts and minds have to change. We can do whatever, I mean, we, we have to continue to do our work, but I'm very aware that the workers that we deal with every day are young, never experienced a union, are, uh, most of them are very religious. Religion has a very strong hold on workers. And the left has, in, has totally ignored spiritual, spirituality and religion to the detriment of its own, in India anyway. Now, what does that make me, you know? I'm not, I, I'm an atheist, but I, I have my spiritual life as well. And uh, you can be an atheist and you can be a spiritual person. And I think that uh, it is very, very important for us not to give that space up to the right, because the right is seizing it like nobody's business. In India, the right doesn't have an intellectual tradition, but it has a hold on really bad forms of religion. The left has an intellectual tradition and is losing the hearts and minds of people. So somewhere in there, we have to find the answer. 
I can tell you this much, that every May Day, I have to give this speech in front of workers, rah, rah, you know, revolution, so on and so forth. And uh, every year I explain what May Day is, you know, because so many young workers never heard of May Day. You know, these are not your old trade union leaders of India who say, oh yeah, we uh, celebrated the first May Day in Madras or Chennai. I'm like, who cares at this point, you know? So, today's, so this year I actually, what happened is in the state that I'm organizing called Haryana, the government, this is the new Hindu fundamentalist government. They announced that May Day will no longer be a holiday like it is in India. Instead, they will make September 17th or something, which is Vishwakarma Day, the Labor Day. Now, Vishwakarma is the, so, is the god of, of like, labor, of manufacturing, of carpentry, okay? So, what the right is trying to do in this state is to take a religious icon and make that a labor icon and instead destroy May Day. So, that just blew me up. All my pent-up spirituality <laughs> came out. I was like, what the hell is this? And I just like blasted out I mean, I heard this on the morning of May Day, and my speech was like around four o'clock. By that time, I, re I just threw away my usual rara speech, and I went into Vishwakarma, and who is, and how dare the, and the workers just loved it. They, they were like, they, they told me that was the best speech I've ever given. So, I mean, I think that we have to, uh, and I wasn't being religious. I was like, Vishwakarma, okay, he's, he's a labor guy, sure. And would he support what the government has done today? So, I, ha I mean, I brought Vishwakarma into the demonstration to discuss him as a, hum as a person, what he would think and the government and, and basically because the the workers would respond to Vishwakarma, you know. But if I just said, oh, what a horrible thing, made a international working class, we should stick with it and down with the other thing, it would not have worked. So, so this was really the only way, only discourse I could think of and I felt it, frankly. So, what do I want in the future? I, I think that we have to find new ways of producing discourse and producing a new way of thinking among exploited people. Uh, we can borrow some things from old discourses. We have to create some new ones. We have to marry some uh, unlikely discourses. Um, you know, so we have to, but this is the time to create some important messaging. Our messaging is off. And when I say messaging is off, I don't mean in an advertising way. The way we talk, the way we are responding to things, there's something that is off and we have to correct that and we have to go deep within ourselves. We have to look deep into the constituencies we work for and really try to see what will make it click so that we can connect with people again. <laughs> I think that's a big challenge in so many countries these days, as we can see the, the recent development. Um, and I think also in Germany, most of the young people don't have any union experiences. Um, and I think this could also be seen as a chance to, to create new alliances, to try to, as you said, to find new ways of speaking to people, um, speaking a language that young people understand also. Because we have the same problem in Germany, I would say, uh, that some people don't speak the language of young people especially in places like unions. Um, 
How do you feel about such event today? I know you're traveling uh, to ILO in Geneva, to New York. You've also been in our New York office uh, on a very high level. Uh, level. But also being here and having like kids in the back to, to jump around and to scream. What do you think, where is it necessary to fight? Where do you think is it necessary to have discourses and discussions and how? Well, I think actually I'm, I was telling you earlier, I'm very impressed with today's event. I think it's been really uh, impressive with the different spaces uh, that you've been able to create within a reasonably small area for different purposes and for different people. Um, I'm going to think about this, actually. I'm going to discuss it with people uh, within our own organizations because, you know, with women, with children, with men in the unions, it's really, really important that we find ways of working in separate spaces but also coming together in a space which allows uh, people to do uh, different things. So, so I'm very inspired by your event. I think it's a very high level event. Just for the record, I hate going to the ILO meeting in Geneva. It is an obligation that I have to do to stand through all those discussions. Not the ILO per se, but the ILC and that's suffocating general auditorium. But um, so you're doing great. Thank you. Um, we had some interesting aspects in today, like earlier sessions. Um, what is needed? We will talk about consumerism later on, the role of consumers, and uh, because many people over here obviously know about things and about bad working conditions. But many friends of mine also asked me, like, but what can I do? You know, we talked about the companies today, company duties. We talked about the states and the role of states. In my opinion, it's, it's needed to fight on all the different, like on a broad range and, and fight different fights and battles. But what do you think is like most needed? Is there something most needed or is it? Um, I think that you, you will know most about your country, but what I can tell you about where I'm coming from is that As I think Thomas was saying earlier today, there is a global north in our countries as well. So we have the consumers in India as well. Uh, we have the big Gap fashion store and the Marks and Spencers. And there is no consumer movement in these countries. And actually, um, we, are, we think too much We, 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 we are narrowing down. We look at the Western countries as only having global north in them and not the global south, and they do have the global south. And in the global south, we are only thinking of the global south without thinking of the global north in these countries. So we have to, I mean, one thing that is pending on my list to do, and, and it's the one that doesn't get done because we never have the money or the luxury to do it, is really build a consumer movement in India like you have here. I mean, that would really help if like both consumer movements came together against the brands, that would be powerful. But, you know, everybody wants to sort of help you organize workers and that is correct. We need to do that. But there is this other job pending. I don't know when it'll get done, but that's sort of another important piece out there. Oh, that's interesting. I think this uh, linking, linking different actors in the fields is very much needed. We talked about earlier with the exchange network of like workers that uh, people who work here in a shop like store level for H&M are also being exploited to bring them together because at yeah. the end they are the same boat. Um, and that's a very interesting aspect, the consumerism. I would uh, stop here, but I yeah. would still like to ask you if someone still has a question to Ananya. Otherwise, I thank you very much for the time, for your personal stories that you shared with us, and hope you still have a good time later on.
and let's continue working on this. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.